everybody. Today's lesson is about isometrics, okay? A lot of people don't really know much about isometrics. What are the benefits? When to do them? How do you do them? What are the different types? So I'm hoping that I can delineate that pretty clearly here. And I will say this, I think isometrics are one of the real gems in arm wrestling training. And if you really need to bring your peak force up in one area quickly, isometrics are your best friend, okay? So background, there are two basic types of isometrics. There are yielding isometrics and there are overcoming isometrics. All right, we don't care about yielding isometrics. Yielding isometrics are what people refer to as static holds. You just pick up a weight and you resist it against Earth's gravity until you fatigue and you're ready to set it down. We don't care about that, that's not, that's not in the scope. But overcoming isometrics are really gonna be your best friend when it comes to developing peak force, okay? So, doing an overcoming isometric, well, what, is that, what, what does an overcoming isometric look like, okay? Well, what that means is contracting against an immovable object, okay? It means as hard as you're pushing or pulling or squeezing or whatever, the thing isn't gonna move, okay? The right way to do an overcoming isometric is to lift a weight, an implement, a handle, whatever, a strap, with a submaximal load. And after that submaximal load has started to move through the range of motion, it, it, it is chained to something that won't move. Either a heavier weight, the wall, the floor, a table, your best friend, doesn't matter. Something that something that won't move. Okay. So from zero till here, you're lifting whatever percentage of the maximum, and then it stops hard. And then you, then you contract as hard as you can against that hard stop, and it won't move. And you do that for six or eight seconds, maybe 10 seconds, and that's the rep, okay? I'll demonstrate that here. I've got a handle on one side of this pulley system, right? But I chained this side of the pulley system to this side of the pulley system. There's a little bit of slack, right, as you can see. Here, the chain's not tight, so I'm just lifting the weight on the one side of the pulley system. But once this chain tightens up, now I would have to lift the weight from both sides of the pulley system. It's twice as heavy and I can't do it. And to do this rep, I would, once it hits that second side, contract as hard as possible for six or eight seconds, and you're done, okay? So what's happening while you do this? Well, at first, you're only gonna be, you're, the force you're outputting is only gonna be that submaximal until you reach the wall. Right. And then trying to contract as hard as possible over that six or eight seconds, the, the, the force that you're lifting will actually go up, okay? Because your brain is gonna be trying to recruit more muscle fibers. It's going to send stronger signals through the, the, the neurons until you fatigue. So your force will actually tend to go up throughout the rep uh, until you start to fatigue and then it'll come down and, and, and you'll set the weight down, okay? Why is this a good thing? Well, what this does is it, it trains more muscle fibers to be, uh, to be recruited in a movement, okay? So um, the problem that it does uh, bring up is that because it takes so long to recruit some of these extra muscle fibers, you decoordinate yourself a little bit, okay? Coordination is basically the simultaneous recruitment of multiple muscle fibers. It's just everything coming at once together. And uh, doing this, you're, you're, you're just, you're starting to add more muscle fibers into the, into the exercise, into the range of motion, which is only, only right there but it's after six seconds or eight seconds. So in order to regain some of that coordination, what you're gonna to have to do is some full range of motion and especially full range of motion with bands or other accommodating resistance, okay? Because that'll, that'll force those multiple muscle fibers to come in more at the beginning of the movement. But yes, over that period of time, the force that you're contracting will go higher and higher and higher. And over the period of, you know, whatever your training block is, your peak force will go up. All right, and you'll be able to create a higher peak force than what, you'll able, uh, what you're able to create during max effort training, okay? Not every rep and not every time, but uh, the potential for higher peak forces is here, not in max effort training, okay? And why would you do this instead of max effort training? Well, you'll still do max effort training, but the benefit to doing isometrics instead of max, max effort training is you don't have the maximum weight threatening to rip you back open, and two, when you, when you do max effort training, once the weight comes up off the ground, you're not really gonna recruit many more muscle fibers, okay? The, the ones that are recruited are gonna continue to contract and over the whatever, one second, two seconds that it takes to lift the weight, then you're done. Instead of spending six or eight seconds trying to force more fibers to be recruited, you don't really have time to do that in the rep, then you're exhausted and done and it's over, okay? So 
there are benefits to doing both, okay? But uh, max effort training and isometrics together really drive up your peak force. But isometrics specifically in a small range of motion in a small area will, will drive up that peak force even more. As long as you pair it with uh, coordination improving exercises, you won't really have much of a loss on the table either. Once that peak force goes up, you're loaded up and ready to go, those isometrics will help you overwhelm your opponent, okay? You know, one of the drawbacks, other than the decoordination, is that the isometric only really works over a relatively small range of motion, okay? So if I'm doing like a, a, a hammer curl or something, and I have a, you know, I, I set the chain here so that I'm lifting the weight and then everything stops, it's only within a few degrees of where that chain is that's going to uh, be affected by this isometric. It's not gonna affect my strength very much out here or all the way in here. The nice thing is, as arm wrestlers, we don't really care that much about that because once we're in a position, we're, we're trying to keep the angle small. We're just trying to maintain our rotation. We're not really doing a, a, big, a big range of motion with this. And our wrist, you know, you, you almost get the initial bend in for free, and then you have a pretty small range of motion for the isometric training. So the ranges of motion generally are really small in arm wrestling too, and most of the movement comes from the shoulder, the body, and using your, your bigger base muscles to overwhelm your opponent. But here, the hand, the wrist, the arm, generally you're, you'd like to keep the angle angled together. And if you're strong enough in that angle, you don't have to worry about it getting opened up and worrying about the rest of the range of motion, okay? So uh, it's pretty much benefit on top of benefit for arm wrestling. There's a couple small drawbacks that you can address or don't care about, okay? Now, last thing isometrics, recovering from injuries, okay? There's some literature out there that indicates that uh, overcoming isometrics are what provide the strongest recovery stimulus for tendon and ligament injuries, okay? Um, I don't have the papers in front of me. I read them a long time ago. But better than doing a, a ton of super lightweight movement and trying to get a pump better, you know, you, you need to do that at first. Like as soon as you get injured, you need to be moving that thing as soon as possible, okay? You need, to, you need to try to get some blood flow, something in there to protect it a little bit and get some nutrients in there. But we'll provide the strongest stimulus to strengthen the, the tissues that are already there is isometrics, okay? You need to be able to feed it. So after doing your isometrics, if you have an injury, you start with zero weight basically and you contract against an immovable load and, and you'll find really quickly you'll be able to add base weight while contracting against that immovable load. And as long as you, you know, do some kind of pump movement afterwards, something to get nutrients in there, you will probably see the fastest rate of recovery for any of these soft tissue injuries. So I've dealt with this myself, all right? I spun my wrist out really bad in a tournament, uh, geez, probably four years ago now. Yeah, four years ago, I spun my wrist out really bad. I couldn't even open my car door without having tape all over my hand. But doing, it, was, it wasn't this, it was a smaller size handle, but I started doing isometrics with it with no weight. And then I was slowly able to add weight and it didn't take that long before I was able to arm wrestle confidently again, okay? And, and, and you know, you can see this in other areas as well. Uh, I, I did the same thing with my elbow once when I blew it out and stretched it a little bit. And I started doing that with a wrist wrench side pressure with basically no weight and was able to recover myself doing isometrics. Um, whereas when I've had elbow pains or struggles in the past, doing a bunch of reps and trying to get blood flow never really seemed to do the trick for me. I still seem to be sore one month, three months, six months later, but I started doing no movement and just loading up, whether with a partner on the table or with, with, lo with load, really quickly I started to recover, okay? So isometrics great for peak force development, and they're great for helping you recover from injuries when you've had them in your tendon, tendons and ligaments. So uh, that's it, guys. Uh, good luck programming your isometrics in. If you want help with that, let me know, and see you next time.